the throttle up left. Welcome to the Mille Miglia, a four-day historic rally covering some of the best roads that Italy has to offer. It's been called the most beautiful race in the world, and we are going to show you why. The Mille Miglia dates back to 1927, when it started as a 1,000-mile point-to-point race across the Italian countryside. It was run at speed on open roads with drivers putting their cars to the ultimate test, often testing their luck too. That era ended in 1957, when a pair of tragic fatal accidents brought the race to a close. It lingered on for a few years as a limited speed showcase, but that event ended too. That is until 1977. In 77, the race was reborn, reinvented as a historic rally open only to cars that would have been eligible for competition in the original. That is to say, cars produced before 1957. The modern Mille sees racers covering a vast swath of Italy and doing so at a very good speed, but ostensibly abiding by all Italian road laws, being scored for the accuracy of their timing, not for their speed. Think of it like a time-speed distance rally or a regularity rally, but one that's unlike anything else on the planet. The 2019 event would begin in Brescia, home of the Millimilli Museum, and over the course of four days crossed 1,794 kilometers. That's over 1,100 miles of Italian countryside, running down the east coast to Servia Milano Maritima, then continuing southward to Rome, before turning northward again to Bologna, and finally returning to Brescia. The day before the start was a day for finalizing registration, checking out the competition, and getting familiar with my ride. What was my ride? Something very, very special. It's a 1930 4.5 liter Bentley blower called the Demonstrator. Bentley entered two cars into the race celebrating the company's centenary and looking to address some unfinished business. You see, back in 1930, Bentley entered a blower into the melee, but withdrew it prior to the start, fearing the car wasn't ready for the challenge that lay ahead. Now, 89 years later, we were there to celebrate the company's 100-year anniversary and to finish the race, and to finish well. But first, I had a little paperwork to attend to. So just to give you an idea of what I'm going through, this is my route book for tomorrow. This is a high-level overview, starting in Brescia and then working our way down to Milano Maritima here. Uh, and then uh, I've got this listing, which is all the various sections that we need to go through tomorrow. The red ones are the ones that I'm most concerned with. Those are basically the specific time trials, and they give you an exact distance and time that you need to run through here. So we've got uh, the first one, for example, is 460 meters, 54 seconds we have to go through that in. That gives us an average speed of 30.67 kilometers per hour. And we will lose points for every fraction of a second, every one hundredth of a second that we are early or late. So what am I doing? Basically, I'm taking that information and plugging it into my handy-dandy graphing calculator from high school here, which I've written a little program on here that just spits, uh, spits out a table. And then I can put that table and I'm writing that down into a notepad. Now, yes, I could probably do Microsoft Excel and print out those values instead. Um, but rather, I actually kind of like going through this process of writing through the individual times. It basically tells me for every 100 meters what time we need to be at that 100 meter mark. Um, by writing it down, I feel like I'm getting a little bit of a preview of the stage in my head. And also, I kind of like having this be just a simple manual thing. No computers to break down or anything like that tomorrow either. And then, of course, on top of all of this, I've got all these routes and everything else I need to go through, all the instructions, so many instructions uh, for the course of the day. And if all goes well, we will arrive at our destination tomorrow evening at uh, a, little after, a little after 10 o'clock in the evening. Before the start, all the cars gathered at the Mille Mille Museum in Brescia, giving me another chance to see what we were up against and to oogle some of the 430 world-class cars who'd entered. Many of these machines spend their lives relaxing in museums, where they're secured behind ropes and kept religiously clean, only to be trotted out a few times a year and put through their paces at events like this. 
Bentley's pair of blowers looked like monsters compared to some of the svelte roadsters on display, some simple and lovely, others ornate and worth more than the most expensive of modern hypercars. But before long, it was time to put on our vintage headgear, strap on our goggles, and hit the road. Sitting behind the wheel to my right was Robin Peel, head of Royal and VIP Relations, a title that must surely be unique to the world of Bentley. For the next four days, Robin would have the job of physically wrestling this lovely blower across the Italian countryside, while I as navigator had the mentally draining task of ensuring we got where we needed to go, exactly when we were supposed to get there. Along the way, we would receive penalties for arriving either too early or too late at any checkpoint, with certain time trial sections timed down to a fraction of a second. And all I had at my disposal was a kitchen timer, a vintage odometer, and my wits. Wits that would become seriously frayed along the way. The most challenging bits were the time trials, a series of very short stretches of closed roads that Robin and I had to cover at a precise speed. With a half dozen or more of these run back to back, there's no time for any calculations, so my preparations the night before were put to the test as we tried to cross every timing strip at the exact moment the route book dictated. Being just a fraction of a second off would mean penalties at the end of the day and a lower finishing position as a result. We were blessed with good weather along the way, and though the first day was short, just 322 kilometers, I was still pretty well wiped by the end of it. Ah, oh, I have just gotten back into the hotel room after a very long day. It is a little after 11 o'clock at night, so we hit the road uh, a little after 1.30, but just before 2 o'clock, I guess it was. Yeah, that was a long day, and it's going to be an even longer day tomorrow, but uh, absolutely incredible day, though, to see all the fans that came out to cheer for every single car, even well into the night. A lot of great help from the police officers, shutting down roads for us, letting us through intersections, that kind of thing. And just an amazing, amazing experience. Uh, I did realize that my navigation skills need to improve. I did a lot of prep work last night that ultimately just created way too much data for me to possibly handle in the car. So I'm going to simplify a little bit tonight. I still got some work to do to run through tomorrow's time trials because I couldn't read the stopwatch and the trip computer and watch the pace notes all at the same time. I need a third eye to be able to do that. But otherwise, we did pretty well. We didn't miss any turns. We were early at all the major checkpoints, uh, which meant we could kind of sit and wait a little bit. And then at the end of the day, thank goodness, they uh, decided to let us all check in early without penalty. Normally, if you check in early, there's a pretty significant penalty. Um, but tonight, they, I guess, wanted to let everybody uh, get to bed a little bit early, and I do appreciate that. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to shut down for the evening, uh, go through my notes, um, get things ready for tomorrow morning, because I need to be in the car at 6 a.m. <clears throat> yeah, but it's going to be worth it. Our departure was indeed bright and early, or dark and early as it were, but it quickly saw us spearing off into the countryside and through some lovely villages, some of which came bearing gifts of fresh fruit that were quite welcome. On the open road, the blower very happily cruised along at 65 miles an hour and above, but things got far more memorable when we were crawling through the narrow, walled streets of Assisi, a stunning citadel that put all of its history on display for us as we rolled through brakes squealing and engines echoing. Bad traffic in the afternoon meant some risky passes to stay on time, but even though we were keeping on deadline, our arrival into Rome was quite late in the day. I had to resort to my personal headlight, that is the one I strapped to my head, to be able to read my notes as we made our way through the city's crazy streets and past the stunning sights I sadly didn't have time to admire on this night. It was about this time I started to realize I was struggling to do basic math, things like average speeds and even figuring out time zones. Sleep deprivation was already beginning to catch up with me, and we weren't even halfway there. I've just made it back to the hotel. Uh, it is just after 11 o'clock at night. Uh, we were in the car this morning at 6 a.m. So yeah, that's a long day of driving. Uh, we covered about 560 kilometers, which is, uh, I really can't do math right now, but it's over 300 miles anyway. And yeah, that may not sound like that much in a day, but given a lot of this was forced to be very slow, a lot of these sections were 20 to 30 kilometers an hour, 
And given we were driving through the Italian countryside, which if you've never had the opportunity to do it, it can be a very slow endeavor indeed. Let's say we covered a lot of ground today, given everything. And of course, given the car that we were in, which is 90 years old, I put on suntan lotion four times today. But as you can maybe tell, uh, I'm a little bit um, darker than I was yesterday. Uh, We'll see how red I am in the morning. Man, what a day. Really exhausting. But it's really good. Uh, a lot of the changes that I made to my planning last night helped me get a little bit more sleep. Still only about uh, three and a half hours, but saved a little bit of time last night and definitely made things easier today by simplifying things. But really, you know, the race is, is, is less about uh, tracking your time and more about just the experience. Uh, absolutely overwhelming today. Going into a CC and the crowds there were just unbelievable. And then coming into Rome tonight was absolutely manic. I've driven in Rome a number of times. It is not fun. And to try to do it in a fleet of cars that are at least 60, 70 years old was incredible and terrifying at the same time. We managed to get to all of our checkpoints today on time. The first checkpoint, we had 15 seconds to spare. That was after driving like 120 kilometers. Uh, we had 15 seconds to spare, which is pretty incredible, but we made it. Yeah, I'm blanking on everything else right now because my mind uh, is, is shutting down uh, sleep deprivation. But I've still got uh, about an hour or two's worth of work to prep for tomorrow. Even longer day ahead tomorrow with even more uh, time trials and challenges ahead tomorrow. Uh, and I'd like to be a little bit prepared and try to get a little bit of sleep. So, um, good night from day two. Day three was another early morning and another long day, but the one with perhaps the most memorable destination of the entire event, Siena. A stunning city that's among the most beautiful on the planet, I'd visited there just a few years before and marveled at that beautiful town square. Now, here I was racing through town, tearing through streets barely wider than the car itself, past bemused vacationers eating their tourist fare, and then parking up in that very square itself. All these cars in that amazing setting was just another unbelievable scene in this unbelievable race. But it wouldn't be long after that we were out and once again stuck in traffic. This time it was Bologna we were trying to enter and the roads were even thicker with congestion than the day before. A police escort helped us make it on time, an arrival late in the evening that still saw us cutting through streets lined with spectators who wanted nothing more than to see and to hear and to smell the cars. We were more than happy to oblige. All right, I just got back to the hotel from uh, day three, the most challenging day. It is um, it is about 10.30 right now, and it was... It was an amazing day of highs and amazing day of lows too. Uh, started off great, uh, really good morning, some fun roads, a lot of really technical challenges, the time trials today where we need to hit intervals at precise times measured to the hundredth of a second. I felt like we got into a good rhythm today. The average speeds, I think we did pretty well there too. Everything was going well and then in the afternoon um, we hit traffic. I don't have any other way to describe it other than traffic for about three hours. We were stuck in some really awful rush hour and it was just awful because we had a checkpoint that we knew we needed to get to in time or we were going to lose points. And I was doing the math every 30 minutes of how far behind schedule we were. We were on track every time, but to keep on track, we had to do some occasionally questionable things to catch up. Uh, Thankfully, we had a police escort for part of it, but it was very frustrating. I'll put it like that. Imagine being thinking that you're going to miss your flight and rushing to the airport. It was like that for a couple of hours straight, and um, that was not much fun. But then after that, we climbed up this beautiful mountain, up uh, getting up toward the Alps. It was very cold. We came down this beautiful, fast-flowing road, uh, people cheering the whole while. And then we came into Bologna, the center square of Bologna, just a massive crowd of people cheering and screaming and everyone loving the car, wanting a picture with the car, wanting a picture with me for whatever reason. And that was incredible, absolutely incredible. Yeah, highs and lows, definitely highs and lows. Uh, Tomorrow, a little bit easier day. I get to sleep in until, I think, 5.30 tomorrow. Pretty good. Uh, Still going to do a little bit of timing work tonight ahead of some time trials tomorrow. Um, But we finish up at 4 o'clock tomorrow. 4.25 will be our finish time tomorrow, Uh, which means I might be able to get a full night's sleep for the first time in a long time, and that's going to be pretty good. And I'm really tired. (laughs) The final day of the event was among the shortest, but by this point my body and mind were definitely struggling. The worst? The weather had finally and properly turned against us. We'd run through the occasional shower before, but this morning it was properly raining. 
I was cold and miserable in the open top Bentley, and without much of a heating system to speak of, I had little more than the wind burn from the previous days to keep me warm. It was remarkable to see so many priceless machines covered in Italian muck and grime from the rain, but that's all part of the experience. Eventually, the weather broke and we covered the distance of that final day at a relatively relaxed pace, winding our way back into Brescia on familiar roads and into the finish, where I handed over the last time card and we knew we'd completed the event. Job done. But not quite done. After the real finish came the ceremonial finish, where we pulled up on stage, received a few trinkets for our troubles, and then relief. Robin, brilliant work again. Thank you for keeping me safe and bringing us home. Oh, finally, I can climb out of this thing. Oh, it's been four days, well over a thousand miles. This thing didn't skip a beat, uh, and I am absolutely exhausted. This has been an absolutely incredible experience, and I don't even know how to summarize it. So let's go to voiceover, and maybe I'll say something a little bit more cohesive there. <laughs> We covered the entire distance in this beautiful example of an 89-year-old piece of machinery which didn't develop a single problem. Even ignoring the moving time, we spent hours and hours idling away at various checkpoints, something many cars half that age would struggle to manage. And how did we finish? We came home 153rd out of the 430 entrants. Given the complexity of the event and the high-tech rally computers that many of those competitors were using, as a rookie, I feel pretty proud of that. And perhaps most importantly in the world of motorsports, we beat our teammates. But as for summarizing the experience, as it turns out, I wouldn't have to just yet, because my experience wasn't over. Fast forward two months, we've teleported halfway around the world. We're now on the lawn at the Pebble Beach Concours, where Bentley's brought one of the two cars that entered into the Mille Miglia. And after it's done here on the lawn, after it's judged, I'm gonna finally get my chance behind the wheel. This car, the Birkenblower, was the sister car of the one I campaigned through Italy, and the very car that was entered into the Mille Miglia way back in 1930. All right, Robin. We fast forwarded a few months, we swapped seats. I'm in the right seat, which as an American is a little bit unusual to be sitting here with a steering wheel in front of me. Um, but the controls are a little bit different than what I'm used to. So before we get going, can you tell me where everything that I need to know is where it okay. is? Okay, same principles as our Mille Mille car, Tim, but yeah, okay. they look different. So yeah. in front of you, top right, there are two brass switches, which are magnetos. Okay. So you flick those down. Uh, bottom left, another brass switch, which is the fuel pump. The switch is on, yeah. okay. and then under my left knee is the main battery, which okay. will then activate everything. What so about? we start with the battery, magnetos, fuel pump, and then this big brass button is your starter. And driving controls, obviously I can't miss the wheel. Shifter is on the right, which is interesting for, uh, on a UK so car. un-ergonomic, but in the 1920s that's where it was. It's, it's four gears, there's no synchro mesh. H pattern? Your, yes. Okay, one, two, three, four. Four. Okay. Um, no synchro mesh, so on the way up it's just gently, gently, on mm -hmm. the way down it is double de Double de -clutching. okay. And gas pedal brake? Okay, so again, we are slightly confusing here. Uh -oh. Your middle pedal is gas. What? Your middle pedal is gas, Why? your right pedal is brake. The race cars were always that configuration because if you think 1929, there was no established way of doing it, so it was the norm then for race cars. But they've had 90 years to fix that, Robin. Well, we... <laughs> it's how it is. <laughs> All right, gas in the middle, clutch on the left. Brake on the right, battery down here. Okay, turning that. And then magnetos. Magnetos down. Fuel pump. Down. Fuel retard. Fuel retard, do I need to yell Fuel clear or anything like that? And then the big brass starter. Clutch in. Oh, beautiful, right on. All right. Where's reverse, by the way? Um, if you look down, Tim, it's, it's, it's back, it's all the way right and down. Okay. But you'll see a little metal um, metal bar. Yeah. You need to flick that to the right to allow you to get it to reverse. <laughs> the reason it's there is if you're in four, third gear and yeah. you're racing along, you don't want to, you don't want to get it to reverse. So, right. so you put it back when you finished getting it to reverse. All right. Given we've, we've chosen a very narrow parking line here, I think I'm going to need to reverse sooner than later, but we'll see. All right, so this is a so, heck of a clutch. One, one more tip. So yeah. once the clutch is engaged, leave it for a good three or four seconds before you try and get first in. All right, here we go. Clutch is in. Just a second. Is that first? I don't think you're in yet. Okay. Come back to 
second, then try first again. Touch all the way down. Yeah. There. Okay. Gas in the middle. We're moving! I didn't stall it! Look at that! I'm very proud of myself. Don't nope, forget, break on the right. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna almost immediately turn the U-turn. Oh boy. Okay, here we go. Wow, this is quite some steering here. Okay, break on the right. Okay, nice. The thing is, yeah. all about slow and steady. Don't yeah. rush anything. So I gotta pull this up. Is that right? That's perfect. Again, give it three yeah, or four okay. seconds, right. let it engage. Gas in the middle. And always turn when it's moving. Where's my rear view camera? My brief time behind the wheel gave me that much more respect for Bentley's Robin Peel, who hustled the car through the Italian countryside for four days straight and got us out the other side safely. Just driving this is an experience that requires full physical and mental commitment. 
racing it would take that to another level. And hey, if you want to experience this for yourself, that just got a little bit easier. Bentley's actually going to build a dozen new 4.5 liter blowers just like this one that I raced across Italy. Price? Not disclosed, but it'll surely be the sort of sum that would get you comfortably into a futuristic hypercar. That modern alternative may be faster, but I assure you, it couldn't possibly deliver an experience that's anything like this.